Now in the true spirit of Ted, I will not go to space, but I will go through hell. Because I'm knowing we prepared a live demonstration of a teleoperation of a robotic system that is located in the Netherlands more than 500 kilometers away. So let's jointly have a look how the not too distant future of robotics will look like. When you're thinking about robotics, you might think of humanoid robots being among us, doing all the tasks we don't want to do or we shouldn't do. You might think of Google car driving in cities autonomously between normal people. Or you might think of robotic systems monitoring us, leaving you with some amount of fear. Other people will feel the excitement of what robotics can be in the decades to come. In 2025, if Moore's law is correct, and it seems like it is, computing power will reach the point where we can have the computing capability of the human brain on normal personal computers. Now, what does this mean? We had Watson win Jeopardy back in 2011, and other computers like Deep Blue beating Kasparov already 1997. But actually, humans are more than their brain. I don't think Watson walked out of the Jeopardy room, went to the grocery stores, bought some pasta and cooked that for his friends. So what's this discrepancy? And if we look at what's going to happen, in order to replicate all the human behavior, the flexibility and the inspiration that we have, in 2050, probably, we'll have these robotic systems that you see walking among us, connected through high-speed internet lines, communication lines, to cluster supercomputers, being able to drive them in different modes to change tasks, to give them other tasks, to be flexible, potentially almost seeming like a human being. But hey, 2050 is quite far away. I will be probably sitting in a wheelchair wearing such a thing in that time. But let's have a look what we can do now and what these robotic systems that already exist can do in order to serve mankind, in order to create economic and societal value. We found this article in Wall Street Journal back in March reporting that for Fukushima, which was the biggest nuclear disaster we have seen, robots couldn't enter. Japan was shocked. Their robotic systems were not able to go there. Now they reached a stage in which they can do monitoring inside the plant and these guys are close to the robotic systems monitoring them, still receiving their radiation dose. Look at their interface. It's a computer, it's computer screens. Look at the gloves and now please, how many of you programmed a robot? Well, that's a couple of five, maybe. Now this guy has to learn it, and with his gloves, almost like astronaut gloves, he has to enter commands and do some tasks there. This is very difficult. Remember Deepwater Horizon? Oil spill? It took 87 days to fix the hole in the ocean. And some people say it's still leaking there. World's largest oil spill that happened costed BP in the amounts of 40 billion US dollar. And a great natural disaster. Now, this made me believe we should use our robotic technology, the robots that you saw before, potentially in a different way. We should make best use of the combination of humans and robotic capabilities. And this made me think about the mechanisms of understanding human-robot interaction. Now the goal here is let's use a robot as simple as we can use an iPhone. Everybody you, of you can use a smartphone. 
do apps, communicate, do actually things that are hard to program in a very simple fashion. So let's have a look what the mechanisms are in order to do human-like operations with robotic systems remotely, where we have a robot on one side in Fukushima or underwater and a human somewhere separated over great distances reaching the globe, reaching to the moon, reaching to Mars. And there are actually three simple things that really matter. You have to transmit vision from the robot to the human operator. You have to be able to feel what the robot feels. Those of you who try lacing their shoes under the table, you have no vision on it, you will know what you can do with your fingers and your hands. How can we make optimum usage of this? And how can we communicate in an efficient way with the robotic systems that we have? Imagine the societal value that we can do. We could send those robots to asteroids to mine precious metals, rare earths, to acquire resources that we need here on Earth to make our life more sustainable. We could fix other problems. And those of you who were afraid of robotics in the future probably thought about, hmm, robotics, that's unemployment. How about this? We moved from a handcraft industry to mass production. Robots came into the factory floors, People got unemployed, economy grew, but now we are on the verge of a new economic scheme which is called mass customization. We have 3D printing, we have fashion industry which wants people who have customized t-shirts and actually 5% of the world fashion market in 2020 is predicted to be mass customized. Now imagine having robots that can work side by side with human people in order to do ta tasks in a flexible way using the best of the robotics and the best of the human in one system. This can be an enabling technology. We could fix such problems in the future in one day, in a couple of minutes, thereby achieving safer exploitation of our resources, protecting our nature. So it's worthwhile thinking in detail how s would such a system look like. If you're looking at the properties of human vision and robotic vision, in fact, human vision is extremely good. I'm seeing all of you there, like you can see the picture of our lab just yesterday, on the left-hand side. It's a big mess. We were assembling that guy behind me. But actually, you're all capable to actually understand what is happening in this scene. And you see the robotic task board on the right-hand side, and you're immediately able to understand what you're seeing. There's a gripper that is distinct from the robot, from a task board, from switches and knobs. Now, this is pretty good. If you look at what a robot does, vision starts to be a more problematic area. Let's have a look at Google Car driving through a city. Actually, how this works is Google Car has different sensors. Obviously, he doesn't have eyes. He has different sensors and he compares. Essentially, he compares databases with databases. And here you can see that he looks at a city and a road as a collection of points. And wherever there is a point where there shouldn't be a point, there must be something moving that the car wants to avoid. So that's a very different mechanism on how vision and perception works between humans and robots. Now, the idea here is to actually merge the two in the most optimum way. So there's a third potential field that we can use which is beyond human vision, where we can actually merge robotic vision with the human one. In the case of controlling a robot system from the space station, you get a very poor resolution real-time video. Nothing you can change about this. So astronauts 
use features of virtual reality perceived through robotic sensors like forces, uh, like cameras, in order to actually perceive in the scene what is going on and visualizing forces. How about the sense of touch? There must be some advantages of robotic systems. And this is uh, Robonaut 2, who was developed by a, a friend and colleague, Rob Ambrose, and his people um, now on the space station. And Robonaut can continue doing this forever. He takes these weights, he holds it somewhere, and he stops. Well, I tried beating him, didn't succeed. Humans, in contrast, have this intricate understanding of what is going on in their bodies. When we touch an object, be it a jellyfish or a brick of concrete, we instantly know the difference because our perception is influenced by our experiences. So if we move at the human side of things, we have again this flexible element that we want to merge with the robotic one in order to have a truly intuitive interface that can give us haptic information back from the robotic system. So in any tailor operation, this is the field how, how we call this, we have a robot and a human, and the robot can transmit forces back to the human from its environment such that the human understands what the robot does and thereby can control very naturally that robotic system. Now that's the simple part. You can add other forces from the robotic system as a whole, from cameras, from other sensors, in order to actually guide the human operator in making higher precision tasks. In terms of communication, distance is the challenge. Distance means time delay, and time delay in for the control people under you means it's getting really difficult. With time delay, it is hard to control systems. If we communicate in a human way, we have many options. Gestures, speech, experience. Robotics do this in a very different way. Robotics thinks in terms of zeros and ones. And we actually can do a teaching to a robotic system in a very intuitive way with exoskeletons. So here you see some video footage of many years back when we actually controlled some very simple 7 degree freedom robots. But this shows nicely how you can just imitate your motion to the robotic system and in fact let the robot be present for you in a place where you don't want to be. At ESA and in spaceflight in general we actually want to bring people to Mars in a safe way, return trip. Now, how are you going to do this? Well, we roboticists thought, okay, let's give the astronauts a hand, let them get to Mars and back, but actually, let's bring them to orbit. From orbit, they will control robotic systems on the surface to do tasks that are human-like, projecting their presence on the surface, doing the geology, doing the additional tasks, and then return from orbit back to Earth, which saves mass, fuel, maybe lives. Since we have this great orbiting station around Earth called ISS, we decided to do a couple of experiments on it in order to control robotic systems here on Earth in order to rehearse what it takes to really do intuitive operations, to do facility assembly, to do inspection tasks remotely from space. And the first hardware just was delivered two weeks ago on ATV5 and it's Haptics 1, which will be the first experiment where haptic interactions will take place in space ever. It's a small joystick and a tablet and this really is the precursor for the next thing to come, which is an exoskeleton in the Exo-1 project. And what you see here 
is a prototype of that exoskeleton. And we envision that with an exoskeleton arm, a tablet PC and nothing else, you can actually control any type of robotic system that already exists and that will exist within the next 10, 20 years. Now, so let's give you a real demo of this. And of course, we want to demonstrate a system that is fully autonomous and not having any connections to it. And every human operator should be able to use that in a simple way. So I'm doing my best to getting in there. Strapping me in there being an enhanced human being, sort of. And of course I could remain here standing there, but in fact the actual fun of it is taking this thing off, taking it for a ride. So let's share my screen with your screen so that you can follow what I'm doing here. Now we're looking at the lab in the Netherlands, in Nordwijk, at the moment, on a KUKA robotic system that we have there. And I'm going to teleoperate this just to show you some of these interfaces. Now, I didn't calibrate this system, in fact, not even in the break. We just switch it on, I get my arm in, I'm looking on the display, and I will drive my arm into the position of the robot arm. And you see, the exoskeleton actually drives me there I'm enabling here and network connection being good, I can start controlling this robot here. And you can see I can move the gripper in the video stream and I'm using this augmented reality features here in order to get force information back from the display to me. Okay, let's try this again. Enabling. And it's forcing my arm up to this reference position here. And live demonstrations, robot doesn't move. <laughs> oh, it does. Well, we actually experience a lot of time delay here. We are going through a cellular network and you see there's no cable attached to me. So this is really unstaged. I could use this system anywhere in the world, in the desert, in the Sahara, controlling any system anywhere else in the world. So, okay, let's see. It's better, it depends a bit where I'm standing and there's a huge force now on me because the system moved, I hadn't been attentive and I will try to actually get to a point where the network reception is a bit better. <laughs> <laughs> and you can see my arm is being driven away with quite a significant force here. Wow, this is difficult. How hard can it be to control Fukushima <laughs> where you receive force feedback? <laughs> <laughs> with some aliens interacting in your scene. <laughs> but of course, we'll try to make this happen. And again, I'm touching the object here. Wow. Now this is pretty bad. Did you all switch off your cell phones? Okay. I'll relax. And you see now we're having probably something like two or three seconds of time delay, which really makes this task difficult. And it would bring you already to the moon and back in terms of the distance and the light time of, of uh, uh, data. So let me move close to this object here. And you see I'm, I'm enabling the gripper now but it just takes too long for data to come back. But I'm having the pin. Wow. And I extracted that pin. 
And what we do here is haptic guidance, which allows us to actually guide the robotic system to points of interest when we're nearby. And I should be really paying more attention to this. <laughs> and then I can try to actually do an insertion task into that hole, which is actually very tough. It's about a one millimeter tolerance. Feeling the force here. And in you go. <laughs> so let's try to get this system back. And in fact, I want you to remember one thing. With robotics, the sky is not the limit. Thank you very much. <laughs>